Okay, everybody. Oh, let me put a little light on this cave so it's not just the same old shadows. Uh, all right. Uh, I am <clears throat> coming to you today after a little bit of technical difficulties. I'm really sorry that it took me so long to get out, but this will be up by four or five o'clock today after the video's finished rendering. Okay, what I wanted to talk today about, <clears throat> this morning in my message, I sent out a note actually about uh, Descartes and your uh, activating, not active, but your lecture video this week where you'll have a little bit of activities is going to be about Descartes. And Descartes famously says uh, the uh, bumper sticker motto that many people have heard, at least in jokes, if nothing else, I think, therefore, I am. So Descartes basically says, I am a thinking thing. Uh, and this is going to be something we'll come back to in a minute because what I want us to do today uh, before we get a little more in depth with that is to actually consider for ourselves um, to consider the diverse ambiguities that actually make up our life. Now, you'll recall that I've said uh, a number of times that for me, philosophizing is the willingness to be uncertain and the will to ask questions. And a part of that comes out of the recognition that we don't really have that complete and utter security that we seem to always want. While on the one hand, uh, we need enough security uh, to feel safe, to just take leisure to think, uh, we don't need, we don't need to become so, we don't need to fetishize. If we fetishize security, we stop thinking uh, and only obsess on safety. So philosophizing is not safe. Uh, and I can actually attest to this. When I was uh, 19, was this 90? This is 2020. In 1994, <laughs> I uh, famously, in one of my first courses at the University of North Texas as an undergraduate, I famously attempted to prove that I did not exist. And let me tell you, uh, you cannot prove that you do not exist. <laughs> and if you try too much, you will probably end up having uh, at least a horrible semester, a horrible few months, or even a breakdown of some kind. And this is actually a, a kind of warning. We want to be, in one sense, we want to be open to uncertainty so that we can have the fullness of that, uh, the fullness of that we have to always be exploring and pushing our boundaries, but we don't want to become so obsessed with uncertainty that we're willing to become dangerously uh, self-destructive, right? Because that sort of ends up, can end you up in a, um, if you go the opposite direction of safety, you become self-destructive or uh, what we might call a nihilistic thinker, thinker, meaning that you sort of think that your whole job is to just destroy everything. Uh, one of the things that we should get to by the time we get to the end of this semester, or these five weeks, is we should reach a point where we kind of can better understand, uh, in a sense, how the fetishism of safety leads to uh, authoritarianism and uh, the uh, self-destructive or nihilistic uh, thinkering uh, leads to, good way to put this, I'm an anarchist, so I don't want to say anarchy. <laughs> uh, it leads to, actually, it leads to a kind of uh, that self-destructive individualism. So you have authoritarianism and you have um, really, I guess, in a sense, a kind of solipsism that believes that the world, solipsism would be, you are the only thing that matters. You are the only thing that exists. And 
I say that that's self-destructive or nihilistic because you basically have annihilated the meaning of anything else in the world, right? And these are the kinds of problems that arise from the mind-body dualism that sort of is the inheritance of Cartesian thinking in the Western tradition. Once you've separated the mind and the body, the self and the world, it's difficult to figure out how they stay connected, right? So uh, <clears throat> you have to be really careful. If you get into a complete certainty that there is only the world and the world must be controlled, uh, that leads to that obsession with security. But if you get into the point of nihilistic thinking and solipsistic thinking where uh, you say you're the only thing that exists and everything arises out of you and uh, et cetera, that kind of means that um, you cut yourself off from the world. You become incapable of being free because you're not in that tension. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about that tension, right? So the question for Descartes was always, uh, what is capable of being conceived as clearly and distinctively as possible? And this, of course, was getting to the point of, in a sense, mathematicizing the world and turning it into a mathematical projection of the one clear and distinct thing for which you can have no doubt, which is that you exist. This, his intention actually is not to lead us in the direction, is not to lead us in the direction of solid system. I actually don't think that's to lead us in the direction of security. It's, uh, it's actually to make us aware that just because we're uncertain about so much, there are some things that we can be sure of, things that we can be certain of, right? Uh, but when we really begin to look at human nature, how clear is that? First of all, we don't even know if there is such a thing as human nature. So you're already in the middle of speculating about something. You're already in the middle of saying, well, you know, everything has a nature, really? Including humans? Right, so Arte, Jose Ortega says, well, I think you can say that everything has an essence, right? And our essence is freedom, but that freedom is not as bound and uh, hard and concretized as some people would want it to be, right? It's, it's true liberation, right? Freedom from and freedom to. Uh, so our, the, the, the issue becomes how clear is human nature? Is the self the same as human nature? Is this I that must exist, this thinking thing that must exist, the same as human nature? And if it's human nature, what is the body? Is the body just a, a prison that we live in? So you end in this mind-body dualism. And Ortega Gasset has some more to say about that that I'll probably bring up tomorrow about how, I'll just say right now, about how the notion that uh, I am... I and my circumstances, right, in a mutual relationship. And when I say that I am I and my circumstances, right, let's go with Ortega, you set, I am I and my circumstances. He actually will say, he actually will say that the mind and the body are circumstances and not identical with I. This is not a standard way of us thinking, okay? And this really gets us into what it is that Simone de Beauvoir really brings to the table for us to think about. This feminist think, well, one of the founding members of feminist thinking, womanist thinking, uh, the, uh, the thinking partner of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, a great friend of Albert Camus, uh, you know, these, these kind of like pop culture philosophers, existential philosophers that we know about. And uh, Simone de Beauvoir wants to say to us, uh, nothing appears crystal clear to us. Even this idea, even this idea that I am, I must be, what does that mean? If I say I am, what am I saying, right? I often, when I ask that question, uh, <clears throat> I often think back to when old Moses went up on the mountain and he stood before the burning bush, right? 
And uh, he said, he was told by the voice of God, you need to go down into Egypt and tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. And then Moses, knowing, you know, how people are, is like, okay, uh, the Egyptians have hundreds of gods. Who should I say is sending me? And old Moses hears from the voice of God, you tell them I am sent you. You tell them I am that am sent you. What does that mean? Do, you, do we really understand what that means? There's been lots of interpretations that the name of this Hebrew God is I am that am, right? In Hebrew, the name is uh, Jehovah or Yahweh, depending, you know, I've just committed a probably multitude of sins by saying the name. Uh, but the point here is, this is a question, right? We're in a we're in a tension with our humanity and the divine, our being human as animal and other animals and nature and all the things around us. We're in a constant tension. And so when we, so when we come forward and we say, well, I know that I must exist in order for there, you know, for there to be any kind of thinking going on, right? So that's a precondition. It is necessary. I have to to exist, to be in this process of thinking. But when I say, I am, what am I really saying? When I say I am, what am I really saying? So de Beauvoir develops an existential exploration of ethics by kind of taking up a challenge uh, that was left over from her thinking partner, Jean-Paul Sartre, who wrote this ridiculously huge book called Being and Nothingness. Uh, so, and basically in there, what Sartre said is so many of uh, the existentialists say is that, uh, and this actually kind of uh, resonates with the Ortega Ega set up there, I am I and my circumstances, that I am free. I am freedom. What is ethics if I'm freedom? And how do we mean freedom? Free to choose? Yet then he turns around inside of all that. He says, I am freedom. Yet every decision I make, okay, every decision I make is a decision for every human being. What does that mean? What, what, you know, where, what, where are we going here? Freedom is the ability to do what you want. But if I have to worry that every decision I freely make is a decision for all humanity, suddenly that freedom doesn't seem like I can do whatever I want, right? And really, uh, Sartre, de Beauvoir, Ortega, Gasset, Carl Jaspers, Martin Heidegger, all the, you know, da, 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 all these people who do what's called existential philosophy. <clears throat> they implicitly understand something that's actually hidden in the, in the English word freedom. That freedom actually means, literally, if you to break it down and be constructed, it actually means doomed to be free. So I am utterly free yet every decision i make is a decision for every human being right and this free being that i have this liberty that i have is my doom right it is my path it is my burden right so simone de beauvoir is you know, talking with other people, giving lectures around France in 1947. And she kind of gets into a discussion with some of her students and some of her friends and then into a debate with Sartre. And she takes it up upon herself to turn, to take Sartre's being in nothingness, to take his idea, I am freedom, and it's really kind of their co-idea, and uh, to take this notion that ethics then would be based in my freedom. You know, we're used to ethics being rules and 
in uh, customs of customs of conduct, right? Now we're saying ethics is actually freedom. Ethics is the birth of our freedom. Okay. If we understand freedom then in this sort of English accident that it means doomed to be free, it actually doomed means having to do. That's that's all a doom is. It's a sort of destiny, right? You have to do this. Well, if you want to be human, you have to do free. You have to do being free. You have to take the burden up of being free, right? Um, if our essence is to be free, to be liberated, to transcend all of these things, but that itself is the birth of how we can be in communication with other people, what Jaspers calls uh, a loving struggle, okay, that's communication is a loving struggle between people who want to, f who want to disclose and explore and enact their liberation. Uh, if I have to be free, if I'm doomed to be free, if I have to do this, if it's my destiny, maybe we should look then at how is free right? And this is the most beautiful accident of etymology. And again, we don't want to say that we don't want to say that a word has to mean what it originally meant 500 years or 2000 years ago when it was first used. But we want to see the little, the little bits of, of love and truth that might still be hanging around in that word. And interestingly enough, if we really look at the word free, and uh, where it comes from, it's literally related to Grimm. If we understand that freedom is having to be friends, therefore understanding that the essence of being human is being free inside of a community, if we think that, if we can grasp that, we suddenly see all the BS that's happened over the last couple of thousand years, particularly in the United States over the last 450 years, has been, if you will, a rejection of friendship and the treating of other people, other lives, other bodies as mere things. Yeah? So, okay. Now you're wondering. Well, we started off talking about Simone de Beauvoir. Now you've made all of these uh, little sidesteps over to Sartre and Jaspers and freedom. Let me uh, do this. I'm going to do a little bit of a there we go. All right, so Simone de Beauvoir develops, she takes up as a, as a um, what do you want to call it, a, a, a challenge for two years to develop an ethic based on this kind of notion that's there in Sartre's being and nothingness, that I am freedom, yet every decision I make is a decision for every human being. How can you have an ethics that's based around that? That I'm doomed to be free, that I have a destiny toward being liberated, become, transcending all of the things that hem me in. But that all of those, but that doesn't mean transcending humanity per se. That doesn't mean transcending the community. That 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 means being in loving struggle with friends, so that we mutually support each other to lift ourselves up to the fullness of our liberation. This is what Plato was talking about, what Buddha was talking about, what certain Chinese and other Indian thinkers and other Greek and Roman thinkers and African thinkers from all over the continent, from Egypt down to South Africa and Mayan and Aztec and Navajo. This is what human beings do. This is what human beings struggle to figure out is how they are in this ambiguity between self and group right? That tension that you only experience liberation from that tension. And I don't mean here you're liberated from being friends with people, but that you cannot experience liberation except in this community. If you just try to be free all by yourself, 
uh, you're probably going to be rejecting your humanity. Or if you just try to have certain people be free because they're the best sort, uh, then you're dehumanizing everyone but the small community you belong to. Okay. So Smunavad develops an existential exploration of ethics, examining ambiguity of being human. And this would be the ambiguities in which each person in every group find themselves. What I really kind of want to focus on here, and I'm going to round things out pretty quickly, is that ambiguity derives from the Greek word ambos. Okay. And if you actually think about what the word ambiguity means, it basically means to be led around in a circle. In other words, Ambos is actually uh, two things that are so mutually dependent on each other. This should kind of give you a little bit of a Buddhist insight as well. Two things that are so mutually dependent on each other, two processes that are so mutually dependent on each other that they, they can never be separated. Okay. If we talk about night and day, as soon as you say die, day, excuse me, as soon as you say night, you've intended day. As soon as you say day, you've intended night. If you say um, left, right, as soon as you say left, you've intended right. As soon as you say right, you're right. So there's all these kind of, if you, if you go up, down, if you say, if you say up, you've already, you've already intended down. So what we call here, if you look down here a little bit, we're always caught between contrary realities. The contrary are mutually uh, uh, mutually supportive, although they sometimes can be treated by people as contradictory. Okay, contrary does not equal contradictory. Contradictory means not just opposed. Uh, not just different from, but negating the other. This is a very important thing. It's why race relations in the United States is so messed up. Because you take two things that in color theory, in actual just aesthetics, are contrary, black and white. And then you turn them into contradictions. And you say white is right right? Black is, is not. Black is, is on the bottom. Black is a contradiction. Or, you know, you, you might go the other direction. You might try to go the other direction, but it doesn't happen very often. I watch a lot of Chinese, uh, Chinese shows, and even there, there's bigotry towards people who have darker skin, right? So, uh, I don't mean Africans per se. I mean that in the Asian peninsula, Asians who are darker skinned uh, because they work outside or because they, you know, they come from, you know, an ethnic background that has uh, uh, more melanin in its skin, they're, they're looked on as lesser than sometimes in these things. So this is a weird um, cultural issue. I'm not trying to say it's as bad in China as it is here, because here we've turned the two things into a contradictory, and that has led to uh, right, that's led to um, uh, choosing one side as right and one side as wrong. Uh, so in that regard, Black Lives Matter is simply trying to say it is true that all lives matter, and we need to remember in saying that every human life matters that Black people have human life. So all lives matter. I know I seem like I've gone off a little bit, but I want to show how an ambiguity can turn into a dualism that's unhealthy if you treat them as contradictories. So, uh, you know, so all lives matter is a premise. It's not a conclusion, right? All lives matter, premise, all lives matter. Or to make it more logical, premise, all human lives are things that matter. Yeah? Okay. Premise. African American people are human lives. Therefore, African American people are lives that matter. That's a conclusion. 
but to just state the premise and then say, I don't have to pay attention to that anymore. That's turning it back in that that's taking the premise and turning it into a contradiction. You're not being, you're not being contrary to the notion black lives matter, trans lives matter, et cetera, et cetera. You're just being contradictory in trying to silence that, that realization, right? So let's lead this back up again, back up here a little more. The idea here of ambos, of ambiguity, is that all of the different tensions, all of the different contraries that make up our experience, birth and death, yeah, purpose and chance. These are Jasper's five ultimate situations, purpose and chance, uh, innoc uh, innocence and guilt, ease and struggle, pleasure and suffering. All of those contraries, they make up a part of who we are, but if we just choose for one side, we just choose for the side we like, if we hide the ambiguity, if we hide the necessary ambiguity, contrary interconnection, right, and choose for only one side, then we begin in that decision to move in a direction of that that uh, up here that I've talked about, that uh, <clears throat> fetishism for safety, fetishism for security that turns into authoritarianism, or if we choose for another side, it turns into that solipsism that says nobody else matters, right? So this is actually something I want y'all to be thinking a lot about uh, as you move forward. And when you're looking at the sections now in um, module two on human nature, pay very close attention to the existentialist and feminist sections. Hopefully quite a few of you will decide to write about those things uh, in, the, in the essays uh, and, and really kind of look for that exploration of the tension of contraries that make up our life. I can list some of these here, real contraries, right? Uh, day, night, and the idea of a real contrary is that the, the one automatically implies the other, even if it's not stated, right? So you have day, night, um, particular, general, uh, what's another one? Uh, oh, a good one would be knowledge, ignorance, right? Uh, these these all are different variations. We have uh, birth, death. Now, what's interesting is when they start being treated as contraries, you begin to see, right? If I assume they start being treated as contradictions, you actually begin to see in that how we get in some of these horrible situations that we find ourselves in. Um, that would be, I'll go ahead and put this down here. If we're just talking about color theory, white implies black, black implies white. And this is an interesting accident of etymology as well. The word black derives from, an, <laughs> derives etymologically from blanc. <laughs> it literally derives from the word white or no color, blank, right? And so it's always the case in color theory that either white light contains all colors or black contains all colors, right? It's the presence of all colors and therefore there's no color present or white is the presence of all color and you can't see it until it's refracted through. So, you know, either way you go. So these two things are actually very contrary. White implies black, black implies white. That's true in the world of color. In the world of sociopolitical structures in the United States of America, these have been turned into contradictories. And notice, if we go back up the list, white, birth, knowledge, particular, day. And if we go back up the we go back up the list of contraries and turn them into contradictions, black, death, ignorance, general, night. Right? So you see how when you take an ambi the, this necessary ambiguity and you hide half of it, 
or you prefer half of it to the other and then you turn them into contradictions, it sets in motion a whole list, a whole structure, a system of prejudice. And we can't be free in that system because we'll never be able to be friends. And that's why it's better for us to be willing to be uncertain and have a willingness to be uncertain and be willing to ask questions and never, never choose security over liberty. Okay. Uh, the people who joined me today, I'm going to ask you to stay on for a second. I'm going to close down the uh, recording, though, but uh, y'all stay on for just a second because I wanted to ask you a question. All right. Thank you very much.